W6LG for Ham Radio Basics. Welcome to my radio room here on Wolf Mountain. Been asked many times to go over the extra class exam and this I think would be a good time. I've got some free time during the holidays. Um, I'm recording this just before Thanksgiving 2018. Hard to believe it's 2018. Going to read each of the questions and only for the most part the correct answer and where I think it's uh, appropriate I'll explain why that is the correct answer. If I don't agree with the answer I may talk about that just briefly but you have to answer the question with the answer that they're looking for. So if I say it's red and they say it's blue you better answer blue. What I'm hoping is that if you go through these videos with me um, two or three times you should be able to sit down and pass the exam. To that end, I've taken a lot of civil service exams uh, and generally done pretty good. Um, carefully read the question. Uh, sometimes it helps to read it twice. If you think you know the answer because you saw it on, in this video and you know it's A, uh, then go ahead and answer A. If the question is one that you haven't seen before or don't remember and can't figure out what it is, just let it go for now and come back to it later. Um, usually when you look at a, these questions have four potential answers. Um, usually you can rule out two that are just so far away from what makes any sense and then you're down to one of two possibilities. And at that point, you got a 50-50 shot. Oftentimes, there's a key word that's in the correct answer, so look for that very carefully. And sometimes that key word is in the question, and it's also in the answer. If you can't figure it out, makes no sense, then put down C as a last resort. So go through the exam, answer the questions that you can, leave, uh, put a question mark next to the other ones, or just leave it. Uh, come back to it later. Read the question word for word. What I used to do was to tap my pencil on each word to make sure I didn't leave a word out because you may read it as this is the correct answer when it maybe is asking you which is the incorrect answer. So just those two letters can make all the difference so read it word for word. The other thing too is be real positive. Uh, if you have a chance to go sit in the room before you take the exam, maybe if you know where it's going to be, uh, if it's in a local facility, go there. If it's in the library, go there and sit down. Um, when you go in, be real positive. Be thinking that you are going to pass. You are going to get this. You're going to do it. I'm going to get all the questions right. Or um, So having said all that, keep a positive attitude. Read the questions very carefully. If you don't recognize it, See if you can rule out two of the answers, and then you're down to one of two possibilities. Um, if you have no clue as to what the answer is, usually it's C. Um, small percentage advantage, small advantage that way, but if that's all you got, that's all you got. All right, let's start. Um, I've got three monitors set up, uh, one attached to a camera and um, over on this one I'll be looking away but this has uh, this monitor which um, I can switch to has all the questions and so I'm going to go through um, in, at this with this video E1 um, the sections are are the following E1 is commission FCC rules E2 is operating procedures. E3 is radio wave propagation. E4 is amateur practices. E5 is electrical principles. E6 is circuit components. E7 is practical circuits as opposed to impractical circuits. E8 is signals and emissions. E9 is my favorite subject, antennas and transmission lines. Uh, they've labeled it E0, but let's call it E10, and that's safety. So here we go with 
the first uh, question sub element, they call them sub elements, E1. I'll read them quickly and I'll read just the correct answer and I'll give a brief explanation as to why I think that's the correct answer. E1 A01. When using a transceiver that displays the carrier frequency of phone signals, which of the following displayed frequencies represents the highest frequency at which a properly adjusted upper sideband emission will be totally within the band? Very poorly worded. The answer for this exam is going to be 3 kilohertz. They're assuming a bandwidth on single sideband of 3 kilohertz. So keep that in mind because it's going to come up again. E1A02, when using it, uh, by the way, that was D. E1A02, when using a transceiver that displays the carrier frequency of phone signals, which of the following displayed frequencies represents the lowest frequency at which a properly adjusted lower sideband emission will be totally within the band? Uh, and again, the answer is D, 3 kilohertz above the bottom edge. Um, the reason why I object to that answer is some signals are wider than 3 kilohertz um, on single sideband. E1A03, with your transceiver displaying the carrier frequency of phone signals, you hear a station calling CQ on 14.349 megahertz upper sideband. Is it legal to return the call using upper sideband on the same frequency? The answer is no because you'll be outside the band. Remember we're talking about 3 kilohertz wide, top of 20 meters is 14.350. So the answer is C, no, the sideband will extend beyond the band edge. And they're talking about the upper band edge. E1A04, with your transceiver displaying the carrier frequency of phone signals, you hear a DX station calling CQ on 3.601 megahertz lower sideband. Is it legal to return the call using lower sideband on the same frequency? Uh, the answer is no. The, si the sideband will extend beyond the edge of the phone band segment. So again, if you're on um, 601, it's going to extend down a total of 3 kilohertz. E1A05, what is the maximum power output permitted on the 60 meter band? Uh, the answer is C, 100 watts PEP effective radiated power to a half wave dipole. Um, they mentioned gain um, uh, compared to an isotropic radiator, a dipole has 2.14 dB gain. So I guess that's why that's there. But anyway, it's 100 watts PEP to a dipole. Uh, E1A06, where must the carrier frequency of a CW signal be set to comply? with FCC rules for 60 meter operation. Um, 60 meters is channel, so the answer is B, at the, at the center frequency of the channel. E1A07, which amateur band requires transmission on specific channels rather than a range of frequencies? Well, we just discussed that. That's D, 60 meters. E1A08, if a station in a messaging forwarding system inadvertently forwards a message that is in violation of FCC rules, who is primarily responsible, accountable, for the rules violation? Um, the answer is B, the control operator that originated the message. Uh, I stopped because it's rules violation and I wasn't sure what what they're aiming for but it's um, the originating station and the control operator. E1A09 what is the first action you should take if your digital message forwarding system station inadvertently forwards a communication that violates FCC rules and the answer is a discontinue the f uh, forwarding the communication as soon as you become aware of it don't contribute to it, don't make it uh, continue on. Uh, E1A10, if an amateur station is aboard a ship or aircraft, 
what condition must be met before the station is operated. Um, of course, you have to get permission from the captain or the, uh, the pilot. So the answer is A, its operation must be approved by the master of the ship or the pilot in command of the aircraft. E1A11, which of the following describes authorization or licensing required when operating an amateur station aboard a U.S. registered vessel in international waters? The answer is B, an FCC license. E1A12, with your transceiver displaying the carrier frequency of CW signals, you hear a DX station on 3.5 megahertz is it legal to return the call using CW on the same frequency? Uh, no, because you'll be outside the um, uh, subband. So the answer is C, no. One of the sidebands of the CW signal, signal will be outside of the band. E1A13. Who must be in physical control of the station apparatus equipment of an amateur station aboard any vessel or craft that is documented or registered in the United States? The answer is B, uh, any person holding an FCC license uh, who is authorized for alien operation. E1A14, what is the maximum bandwidth for data transmission on 60 meters? Uh, and in this case, it's 2.8 kilohertz. Okay, on to the next uh, portion, uh, section B. E1B01, what, uh, rather, which of the following constitutes a spurious emission? And the answer is D, any emission outside its necessary bandwidth that can be reduced or eliminated without affecting the information transmitted. In other words, an unnecessarily wide signal. And if you're on the bands much, you know that happens a lot. E1B02, which of the following factors might cause um, the physical location of an amateur station apparatus or antenna structure to be restricted? And the answer is D. Uh, it's if, if the antenna is in a significant American historical, architectural, or cultural location. E1B03, within what distance must an amateur station protect an FCC monitoring facility from harmful interference? The answer is A, one mile. Uh, chances of that happening are pretty slim these days. Okay, E1B0, because they've closed monitoring stations, E1B04, what must be done before placing an amateur station within an officially designated wilderness area or wildlife reserve or an area listed in the National Register of Historic Places? Um, they want to see an environmental assessment uh, to be submitted to the FCC. I don't know if that's a full environment, yeah, EIR. Uh, I don't believe it is. I was a planning commissioner for a while. I think there's a distinction there. In any case, um, an environmental assessment report. E1B05, what is the National Radio Quiet Zone? And that's uh, C, uh, around the uh, Radio Astronomy Observatory. E1B06, which of the following additional rules applies if you're installing an amateur station antenna at a site near or a public use airport. So if it's close to an airport, a public use airport, the answer is A, you must notify the FAA and register with the FCC uh, as required in Part 17 for obvious reasons. E1B07, what is the highest modulation index permitted at the highest modulation frequency for angle modulation below 29 megahertz? Uh, don't have a clue. Uh, it says uh, B 1.0. I have no idea what that means. Okay, E1 B08. What limitations may the FCC place on an amateur station if its signal causes interference to domestic broadcast reception, assuming the receivers involved are of good engineering design? 
don't know what TV set that would be. But anyway, uh, the answer is D. The amateur station must avoid transmitting during certain hours on frequencies that cause harmful interference. That's a change from the past. E1B09. Which amateur stations may be operated under the RACES rules, uh, Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, and I was the head of that for a while uh, here in Nevada County. Uh, the answer is C, any FCC licensed stations certified by responsible civil defense uh, organization. Could be the Board of Supervisors, could be the town mayor, could be the city council, whoever authorizes it. E1B10. What frequencies are authorized to an amateur station operating under RACES rules? Well, the answer is um, all amateur service frequencies, A. E1B11, what is the permitted, uh, listen carefully to this one, what is the permitted mean power of any spurious emission relative to the mean power of the fundament, fundamental emission from a station transmitter or external RF amplifier. I believe it used to be 30 dB. The answer now is 43 dB. To give you some a little perspective, 43 dB. 40 dB is a 1 and 4 zero, so that would be 10,000 times. It's 43 dB, so that would be double that, 20,000 times weaker than the main signal. That's uh, a long way down. Okay, under the next section, C. E1C01. What is a remotely controlled station? Um, it's a station controlled indirectly through a control link and that's D and that's becoming more and more common. Uh, E1C02, what is meant by automatic control of a station? The answer is A, the devices and procedures for control, the use of devices and procedures for control so that the control operator does not have to be present at the control point. Sort of belabors it, it's just um, the guy doesn't have to be the guy or gal does not have to be there. E1C03. How do the control operator responsibilities of a station under automatic control differ from one under local control, hands-on? And um, th the difference is B. Under automatic control, the control operator is not required to be present at the control point. E1. C04, what is meant by IARP? Um, it's A, and, and it's not capitalized and it should be, an international amateur radio permit, I believe that's a certificate, that allows U.S. amateurs to operate in certain countries of the Americas. E1C05, when may an automatically controlled station originate third party communications? When may an automatically controlled station originate third-party communications? The answer is never. E1C06, which of the following statements concerning remotely controlled amateur stations is true? And the answer is C, a control operator must be present at the control point. Um, to read the question again, it is which of the following statements concerning remotely controlled amateur stations is true? A control operator must be present at a control point, and the control point can be obviously somewhere else. Now, well, here we go. Uh, EC07, what is meant by local control? And the answer is C, direct manipulation of the transmitter by the control operator. E1C08, what is the maximum permissible duration of a, remo of a remotely controlled station's transmission if its control link malfunctions? In other words, it just starts to transmit. The answer is three minutes. Uh, at that point, it has to time. You have to set it up so it times out. E1C09. Which of the following ranges of frequencies is available for automatic controlled repeater operation below 30 megahertz? Uh, the answer is D. The top end of 10 meters, 29.5 to 29.7. 29.7 is the upper end of the band. E1C10, what types of amateur stations may automatically retransmit radio signals of other amateur stations? The answer is B, auxiliary, repeater, or space stations. Auxiliary, repeater, or space stations. E1C11, which of the following operating arrangements allows an FCC licensed U.S. citizen 
to operate in many European uh, countries and alien amateurs from European countries to operate in the U.S.? The answer is the CPT agreement. Uh, that's A. E1C12. What types of communications may be transmitted to amateur stations in foreign countries? This, I uh, bet a lot of guys would get wrong. It says, what types of communications may be transmitted to amateur stations in foreign countries? The answer is C. Communications incidental to the purpose of amateur radio service and remarks of a personal nature. Um, that limits a lot, so uh, keep that in mind. E1C13, which of the following was required in order to operate in accordance with CEPT rules in foreign countries where permitted? And the answer is poorly worded. You must bring a copy of FCC Public Notice DA11-221. Um, you're not going to bring the copy. You must have a copy uh, or take a copy. You're not. Well, anyway. E1D. Amateur satellites uh, is section D. E1D01, what is the definition of the term telemetry? Uh, recently, I did some telemetry uh, in a hospital. Uh, it's a one-way transmission of measurements at a distance from the measuring instrument. So it's a one-way transmission of data. What is the amateur satellite service? And the answer is a radio communication service using amateur radio satellites, stations rather, on satellites. E1D03, what is a telecommand station in the amateur satellite service? The answer is B, an amateur station that transmits communications to initiate, modify, or terminate the functions of the space station. In other words, it sends out controls. E1D04, what is an earth station in the amateur satellite service? This one's a bit tricky because the answer is an amateur station within 50 kilometers of the earth's surface intended for communications with amateur stations by means of objects in space. 50 kilometers, okay. E1D05, what class of license is authorized to control uh, to be the control operator for a space station? And the answer is C, any class with the appropriate privileges. E1D06, which of the following is a requirement of a space station? The answer is A, the space station must be capable of terminating transmissions by telecommand when directed by the FCC. FCC says shut it down, you better be able to do that. E1D07, which amateur service HF bands have frequencies authorized for space stations? Uh, basically the answer is, now we're talking about HF, and the answer is A, um, 40 and above. So A is only on 40, 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10 meter bands. E1D08. Which VHF amateur service bands have frequencies available for space stations? Um, well, it says VHF, so that is 2 meters. Um, you notice 6 meters is not on that list. E1D09. Which UHF amateur service bands have frequencies available for space stations? Uh, 70 centimeters and 13 centimeters, that's B. E1D10, which amateur stations are eligible to be telecommand stations? And the answer is B, any amateur station so designated by the space station licensee subject to the privileges of the class of the operator license held by the control operator. So um, if the space station licensee says it's okay and you can do it within the uh, parameters of the license that that uh, that you hold. E1D11. Which amateur stations are eligible to operate as Earth stations? The answer is D. Any amateur station subject to the privileges of their license. Okay, on to section E. E1E01. What is the minimum number of 
qualified VE volunteer examiners required to administer an element for amateur operator license examination? And the answer is 3D. Um, E1E02, where are the questions for all written U.S. amateur license examinations listed? And they are uh, held by the VEC, so it's C in a question pool maintained by the VECs. E1E03, what is, an, what is a volunteer examiner coordinator? And the answer is C. It's an organization that uh, has entered into an agreement with the FCC to coordinate amateur operator license examinations. E1, E04, which of the following best describes the volunteer examiner accreditation program? And the answer is D. It's the procedure by which uh, the VEC confirms that the VE applicant meets the FCC requirements to be an examiner. In other words, um, the VEC says the guy's okay to do it. E1E05, what is the minimum passing score on an amateur operator's license examination? This one I'm sure you know, it's 74% B. Who is responsible for proper conduct and necessary supervision during an amateur operator license examination session? And the answer is all of the volunteer examiners see. What should a VE do if a candidate candidate fails to comply with the examiner's instructions during an amateur operator license examination? Um, the answer is B, immediately terminate it. You're done. Out of here. E1, E08. Which of the following examinees may a VE not administer an examination? What person can take the test? And the answer is a relative of the VE. That's C. Relatives of the VE as listed in the FCC rules. They define how close a relative is. E1, E09. What may be the penalty for a VE who fraudulently administers or certifies an examination? Um, uh, mine would be Uh, I shouldn't say it. Anyway, um, revocation of the VE's amateur station license grant and suspension of the VE's amateur operator license grant. In other words, they pull the license, and well, they should. Okay, next question, E1E10. What must the administering, administering VEs do after the administration of a successful examination for an amateur license? And C, uh, the answer is C, they must submit the application document to the coordinating VEC organization according to the VEC's instructions. Sort of goes without saying. E1, E11. What must the VE team do if an examinee scores a passing grade on all examination elements needed for an upgrade or a new license? He passed. Now, what do you do? The answer is B. Three VEs must certify the exam, uh, and uh, let's see, three VEs must certify the exam. The examinee is qualified for the license grant, and that they have com complied. That they have complied with administering the VE requirements. Um, he passed the test, and they did what they were supposed to do. E1, E12. What must the VE team do? with an application form if the examinee does not pass the exam? Um, the answer is A, return the application to the, uh, to the guy taking the test. E1, E13, which of the following choices is an acceptable method for monitoring the applicants if a VE opts to conduct an exam session remotely? Um, the answer is B, use real-time video link and internet to connect with exam session to observe the VEs. E1, E14, for which types of out-of-pocket expenses do Part 97 rules state that VEs and VECs may be reimbursed? The answer is A, preparing, processing, administering, coordinating an exam for the license. Okay, Section F. On what frequencies are spread spectrum transmissions permitted? 
The answer is B, on frequencies above uh, 220, 222, uh, 222 megahertz. E1F02, what privileges are authorized in the U.S. for persons holding an amateur service license granted by the government of Canada? And the answer is C, the operating terms and conditions of the Canadian amateur service license not to exceed the extra class privilege. In other words, he gets extra class privileges that doesn't allow him to transmit uh, in the uh, Canadian, well, what would be the Canadian portion of the band, for example, on 20 meters below 14,150. Uh, E1F03, under what circumstances may a dealer sell an external RF power amplifier capable of operating below 144 megahertz if it has not been granted FCC certification? And the answer is A, if it was purchased in used condition from an amateur and sold to another amateur. Um, it's a bit vague, but um, uh, if an amateur operator and it's sold to another amateur operator, uh, that would also include home homebrew amps and that kind of thing. E1F04, which of the following geographic de geographical descriptions approximately describes line A? And it says, the answer is A. A line roughly parallel to and south of the U.S.-Canadian border. Not a clue. E1F05. Amateur stations may not transmit in which of the following frequency segments if they are located in the contiguous 48 states north of line A. Um, that must be due to radar. Answer is D420 to 430 megahertz. E1F06. Under what circumstances might the FCC issue a special temporary authorization, an STA? to an amateur station? Um, the answer is A, to provide uh, experimental amateur communications. Pretty obscure question. E1F07, when may an amateur station send a message to a business? And the answer is D, when neither the amateur nor his, uh, his or her employer has a pecuniary, pecuniary interest in the communications. In other words, they don't have any money involved. E1F08, which of the following types of amateur station communications are prohibited? The answer is A, communications transmitted for hire or material compensation except as provided in the rules. E1F09, which of the following conditions apply when transmitting spread spectrum em emissions? And this is one of the few questions where it's D, all of the choices are correct. Um, a station transmitting spread spectrum emissions must not cause harmful interference. Uh, must be in an area regulated by the FCC or in a country that permits spread spectrum. The transmission must not be used to obscure the meaning of, of any communication. So it's really pretty strict. What is the maximum uh, E1 F10? What is the maximum permitted transmitter peak power for an amateur station? transmitting spread spectrum? The answer is 10 watts and only 10 watts. E1 F11, which of the following best describes one of the standards that must be met by an external RF power amplifier if it is to qualify for a grant uh, to be certified by the FCC? And the answer is D it must satisfy the FCC spurious emission standards when operated at a lesser of 1500 watts or full power. So if it's capable of 1500 watts it needs to be there, if it's capable of 600 watts it needs to be at 600 watts. And again that's at 43 dB down. E1F12 who may the control operator of an auxiliary who may be the control operator of an auxiliary station? The answer is B Technician, general, advanced, or amateur extra. And that was the last question in the first section, uh, or called a sub element. So in the next video, I'll do um, uh, the next segment. This one was particularly long, it took about 30 minutes to read. 
If you have any questions, uh, post them below. If you read a question from someone and you know the answer, please go ahead and answer it. Um, if I made a mistake, let me know so we all know what that mistake is. Um, if you haven't subscribed, please do. Right now I'm at uh, 16,000 plus subscribers and would really like to get it to 30,000. That's my goal. Thanks for watching. I'm Jim, W6LG for Hammerdale Basics. I'll be doing the next sub element E2 uh, very soon. Thanks for watching. 73 from Wolfman.